The 2001 horror remake 13 Ghosts is one of those movies that at 10 years old I could barely bring myself to watch because I was too scared. But now, as an adult, there's an entirely new reason that this was difficult to sit through. My enlarged prostate. Sorry, I meant to say because it's a low quality movie, since my insurance threatened to drop me if I keep revealing my medical history. Uh, well it's my urology screening, so I can live stream it if I want to. Looking back, Thur, the number 13, and ghosts had no business chasing me out of the living room like it did back in the early thousands because it basically looks like the showcase for an advanced special effects makeup class paired with criminally uninteresting characters and a screenplay that borrows only the most gimmicky and pointless details from the 1960 original. Let's not forget about the excruciating sound design, death metal music video editing, and a cast of actors who you will mostly recognize from kid and teen films, which I believe is what made this an entry point for many millennial horror fans, and also the interior design inspiration for many open concept workspaces. So grab some window cleaner and a crucifix for this third 13 in Ghosts installment of Clip Breakdown. <laughs> Hello television viewers, my name is Nick. Thank you so much for joining me once again on my channel for another installment of Clip Breakdown. This is the playlist where we dive into our favorite movies, TV movies, and other such content here on the web, and we break it into pieces, like the number 13 when you divide it by other numbers, to look at each individual clip and say, oh, that's a ghost, or no, that's a human. That's really the only two character types we have in this movie. It's either living or dead. They're all boring, I know that much, but before before we get into it, make sure you click subscribe and give this video a big thumbs up. I want you to know how terrified I was of this movie as a kid, and I don't even think I watched it all the way through because I could not get past like the child. There's like a young boy who's in danger in this, and I was like, that's too real. I'm a young boy. And I, at the time, felt that there was danger at all times creeping in just from the chemistry in my brain. So the movie begins though with a junkyard, as all good things do. This first scene involves F. Murray Abraham as Cyrus, a wealthy person, and then Matthew Lillard is his, like, hired psychic assistant. Is it bad tonight? Oh, bad. That's one way to describe it. Uh, insane seems a little more appropriate. We're talking about the sound effects used in this scene so far, right? Between the cartoonish music, howling wind, and Matthew Lillard's poorly dubbed dialogue, for a moment I thought we were living inside of an episode of Scooby-Doo. And I was gonna give myself a quick sponge bath for that stud Fred, who, according to the hanky code, is down for anything. Wait, you're telling me he uses that scarf to keep his throat warmed up? I knew he was a freak. We get right off the bat that part of Matthew Lillard's character, whose name is going to be told to you, Dennis. Part of his vague psychic ability includes being able to touch you and like understand your sad backstory. <laughs> Get to work. Dennis. How many times have we had to tell you nobody likes it when you touch them with that weird claw hand? It triggers a series of swooshing sounds and music video edits. Do the Foley artists know that not every movement makes the sound barrier shatter? I would say director Sam Raimi of Drag Me to Hell or The Evil Dead is a better example of a director using comic book stylized sound effects to create this world. In 13 Ghosts, the person could be tying their shoe and it's like, when I crack that whip, everybody gonna trip just like a circus. Yeah, it's a circus all right, in that there's too much noise and you're a bozo. Keep your sound effects to yourself. This whole scene at the beginning is a little weird. So Damon comes up and so does his friend, his special friend, I guess. We don't really find out about the nature of their previous relationship, but her name is Kalina, played by M. Beth Davis. They're like ghost activists. I'll give you this, Damon. You are persistent. And what about you, Kalina? You still have that quaint little magical book? These aren't animals you're capturing. 
They're human beings. I'm not sure when Miss Honey stopped being a teacher slash Matilda's adopted mother to start her career defending things that don't exist, but she kind of sounds like an idiot now. How are you going to say that ghosts are human beings? I can't think of two more opposite things. That's the same as saying a dead body is a living thing, and therefore we should let them watch Wife Swap with us. Like who is even paying you to stick up for evil spirits like this? Where's the profit in this whole business model? Did she get a grant from Casper's dad? No, Christina Ricci's dad and Casper, who is the father-in-law of Casper, because they got married, I bet. <laughs> Did Christina Ricci marry a ghost in Casper? Oh, that would be me if I got a talk show. It would get old fast. No, no, I'm not saying that. Endorse it. Any TV execs out there, endorse it. Okay, the truck comes through. I remember this from being a kid too, spraying blood over this junkyard where apparently there's a ghost that they're hunting. Using blood as bait never comes back into play. It just sort of establishes a tease at something cool they could play on. But they do show us some of this high frame rate filmic style that feels very video game like. It's not an ununique mo like look for a movie at the time, but the script. <laughs> Basically, it's Dennis's job to use his psychic powers to be like, the spirit you're looking for is here. How has it killed so many people? And they're like, shut up, we're catching it. And all of these security guards, they're not even prepared for how deadly this ghost is. <laughs> Why do I get the feeling this is the world we would live in if straight men got their periods? I just feel like they would find a way to turn it into alien versus predator every single time. I love the use of practical effects in this scene and how the screenplay kills off a bunch of no names at the beginning to really establish how deadly the ghosts are. Although in retrospect, the majority of stunt work throughout the movie is just lifting people up with wires, throwing them short controlled distances, or these short bursts of golden sparks from the Katy Perry music video. You know, the one that owns the night, like the 4th of July. Firework! Sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm gonna cut that out probably, or I'm not going to. I'll just auto-tune it till it's ready for, I spit old lunch out. We're losing track of this sentence. <laughs> Okay, so this is the Sledgehammer Ghost. All of the ghosts have a name, we'll get into it. But also, as I said, some critics called this sound design because it has so much going on painfully and excruciating physically to sit through. You can actually see just how bad it is in the audio waveform. Like this first scene is completely blown out and then the next scene, which is just people having breakfast is like barely audible. But the sound design is not just too loud, it's also so so confusing in how they use it. Basically, this scene ends with everything going wrong, except they do capture the ghost, the sledgehammer. He's the 12th ghost in the Black Zodiac. I don't like the name either, we'll get there. Regardless, in the process of capturing him, it looks like Damon, the boyfriend slash head ghost activist, died in the struggle, as did Cyrus, even though Damon is not fully dead here. So the wealthy old ghost hunter, ghost hunter didn't survive his ghost hunting. And then we get this like entire life and death of a person in the form of an audio podcast. Before you know it, he's gonna be picking her up and throwing her over his shoulder. <laughs> Why is the smoke alarm on? Uh, why do smoke alarms usually turn on? Start with that possibility and work backwards. If those are the kind of questions you ask when your house is on fire, I'm not surprised you're the dead mom. I can't believe they try to establish an entire lifetime of happiness using these like echoey voiceovers. Why did we need to hear his random surprise party reaction? And he says about the son and daughter, before you know it, he's gonna be picking her up and throwing her over his shoulder? Why would he do that to her? Does she also need to be rescued? you from the fire still, like <laughs> pretty soon. He should have done that for the mom who burned horribly, burned horribly. And you'll see it in the movie. Listen, you'll also hear it too. Jane! You can't go back in there, sir. I'm sorry, sir. She didn't make it. We are gathered here today to honor the memory. I wish Okay, now the sound effect flashback has a lot of featured extras. It sounds like the same guy being like, I'm the firefighter, you can't go in there. I'm the doctor, your wife burned up. And I'm the priest, your family is sad. That's how you know this movie is gonna be a piece of work. I think it's just a little on the nose to show this character looking depressed next to a charred up photo of his wife that burned alive. Like, why is that picture magically standing up? But anyway, that introduces us to our main character, played by Tony 
Shaloub. His name is Arthur Criticos. And we're gonna meet the rest of his family, his surviving family, which are those two kids we saw playing in the background. Dad, will you tell Kathy that keeping a record of death is healthy? Keeping, keeping a record of death, death is healthy. healthy. Yeah. Cause she's being a little slut about it. Bobby. Don't call your sister a slut. Especially when it doesn't even make sense to do so. I'm not saying there's ever a right time to call somebody that, but kids are mean, and the other boys at school are gonna make fun of him if he accidentally refers to someone as a slut when they're really being a bitch. In Hollywood, there are only like three categories of women, so we can't be getting two thirds of them messed up. Also, we get it with the three boxes of boo berries. This movie is about ghosts. Why is your milk unrefrigerated? A lot of the production design in this movie is good. I don't like the design of the haunted house itself, but in general, it looks good. And like all good production design, it makes absolutely no sense when you stop and look at it. There's like, once you're on set for a movie or anything, it's the art director or production designer who who's like setting props out, making the scene look right on camera. And those set dressers are placing objects, but always talking about, does that look placed? Like if you put a bag of chips out and then have a few of them scattered in front of it, you don't want it to look placed. So a lot of the stuff in the back of the scene does just read as clutter, but then when you look at it, you're like, okay, a lot of Coca-Cola products there. From the Minute Maid to the Dasani, oh yeah, to the Coca-Cola. Cases and cases of it. Are you running a 7-Eleven out of your house? Like, what is that? They must really love going to. Oh, uh, what's the name of the wholesale place? Wholesale market. What is the place? What is that place everyone goes? Where they bring like their car? Anyway, it takes forever for them to establish that this family is struggling in the recent wake of their mom's death. Did you do your homework? Is Mr. Peterson been telling you? Ah! We had a bigger place, we wouldn't have this. Well, we don't have a big place anymore, do we? The best I can do for now. Yeah, Kathy, can't you get a job and help out? After all, you've been 17 for about five years now. This is actor Shannon Elizabeth, 28 at the time of shooting this, from the American Pie franchise and Scary Movie. It feels as though the screenplay is desperately trying to downplay her age throughout this whole thing by having her like carry a Cabbage Patch doll in every scene. That is until a ghost starts attacking her in a way that exposes her underwear, obviously. Otherwise, she's basically like, I love just doing normal millennial kid things such as trading Pokemans or being born in the 1970s. Like, no, honey, you fail. The casting is weird in that way because it's like her and then this kid who's legit baby boy. Anyway, this guy shows up who's like Cyrus's lawyer and his name doesn't matter, but he has this digital letter about Cyrus died and therefore they inherited something. And oh yeah, Arthur doesn't realize that he didn't know he even had this uncle. The director was like, no, you don't understand. You just found out that one of your dad's relatives died. You should be smiling like this is your fucking Noxzema commercial, bitch. This movie is R rated, so I'm not sure why the inciting incident borrows its tone from the first act of The Goonies. I suppose they wanted to capture the more adventurous tones that horror movies had in the 1960s, like when the original came out. But the gory opening scene didn't really set us up for this, so it's kind of uneven. I love a horror movie that starts out really positive and like the happy family where you're just like, you know stuff's gonna go wrong for them. But the opening was far too grave for Shannon to be giving us this 100 watch smile right now. And just in in general, it seems like her acting is hindered by the direction of someone who doesn't seem to know how to direct women. Like, what is this? A key? They said, do you mind just popping into this frame like a whack-a-mole, holding that thing unnaturally close to your head? A key? I'm like, yep, yeah, that's what that is, but no one said you had to hold it like that. That was murder mystery dinner theater. This film was a critical and commercial disappointment. It made 68.5 million on a $42 million budget, but after you include marketing costs, it did not even break even. It was only the second movie from Dark Castle Productions, which intended to only produce horror movies based on William Castle horror films. So that discouraged Warner Brothers off that plan. And the next film they released was Ghost Ship in 2002, which also bombed, although it was an original story. So couldn't have been the source material. We watched Ghost Ship during one of my virtual watch parties that I have only on Patreon, where at all levels you can go and access that and all my other 
other archived live streams, or you can also join in live next time. Anyway, another way they try to give an overly modern reskin to this too tame and simple story from the past is by converting regular books and documents from the 1960s movies into uh, video messages and audio recordings in 2001. And on that note, apparently Uncle Cyrus was somewhat of an AV nerd when it came to creating his last will and testament. It is a one of a kind home. I have seen some amazing things. Oops, sorry. He was trying to bequeath all of his money to you as well, but the motion graphics didn't render in time before he died. We strongly suggested a written contract, but he was determined to use that astrology themed desktop image he paid to download. It's time to get acquainted with Arthur and his family. Time out. I am not the missus here. Uh, my, my wife. Uh... Our mom got burned to death in a fire. Bobby. What? It's true. Okay, but not everybody likes talking about it at breakfast as much as you do. If you're old enough to spike your hair using styling cream, then you're old enough to recognize when your dad has depression. And that's on period. Also, while I love that this is the first major American studio release to have three leads of Middle Eastern descent in Tony Shalhoub, F. Murray Abraham, and Shannon Elizabeth, I don't love that the only black character is the live-in nanny who speaks exclusively in early thousands tokenism. Maggie is already a completely invented character that sort of takes a part of what Dennis's character does in the original movie. So like somehow this movie from the new millennium ended up being more racist than the one from 1960 that didn't even have black people in it because of racism. Just saying. This kid is an actor who quit after this movie. The only other thing I saw him in around that time was when he played Elian Gonzalez in the Elian Gonzalez TV movie. F U F suffocate. I got it. I win. Oh, so <laughs> much, so much. Thank you so slick. Exactly. What game were they even playing just now? The first one to spell suffocate into the microphone wins? Actually, now that I'm thinking about it, they could have been playing Hangman, but they also could have included a shot to show us what game it would be. And then Hangman would have some foreshadowing because one of the characters in the Black Zodiac is the bound woman, AKA like the hanging prom queen that we see later. But I guess either the director and or cinematographer and or editor all missed that simple way of giving some confusing dialogue a little more meaning. The family gets to the house. This is a look. Whoa, dad, it's beautiful. I've never seen anything like it. Cool! Yeah, if it were the new Church of Scientology setting up headquarters in our town, but this is not a practical home to live in. What do they think is so beautiful about it? The terrible use of floor space or the Latin prayers that are permanently etched into any of those windows that would have added value to the property. Arthur puts his key in, a key in the hole, <laughs> and the house comes to life in a way that I can only describe as uh, underwhelming. I'm like, we've all seen movies with machines before, so I don't know why they are acting like they just like introduced E.T. to us for the first time. Wow, you can see right through it. I sure hope the bathroom's in the basement. Young women of the world, you probably didn't know, but according to this screenwriter, the only thing that you should ever be concerned with are bathrooms. I wasn't gonna say anything, but that was literally her first thought upon seeing pictures of the house. Bathrooms, bathrooms, everyone gets their own bathrooms. Kathy, do you like really need to go to the bathroom? I know that the movie is actually just setting her up to have a scene in that glass bathroom that doesn't actually pay off later. But what I'm mad about is that they even think this is an interesting character detail to include. This girl and her little brother have a horribly burned mom corpse fresh in their memories, but they never actually seem too concerned about that in a non voiceover way. Like if 13 ghosts could decide whether it's a story about grief or greed, then we could follow it in several directions. Cause then the character development could be all about each of these people dealing with their grief. Not just mentioning a bathroom two times before actually getting to enter a bathroom. That's a little reductive. <laughs> So sorry, everyone. I just needed to step out and get this bowl of 
shredded sweetened coconut. I just thought my mouth would have more debris in it flying out at the camera. 3D, the 1960s movie, you had to use these 3D glasses to see the ghosts, which was a gimmick in theaters. So this is one of the few details that the movie borrowed in the 2001 remake. The characters have to put on these special high tech glasses to see the ghosts. And they were thinking of releasing this movie in 3D, but they scrapped that idea. Although they left some very 3D-esque things flying at you just in case. Okay, so the family gets into the house and starts looking around at all their stuff. Uh, family, just so we all clear, Miss Maggie does not do windows, okay? Once again, this maid character, who is also just a modern day racist mammy stereotype, was not in the 1960s original script. Moving on, the only thing scarier than moving into a haunted house would be uh, moving into a haunted house with no groceries. Luckily, I never have to worry about running out last minute to fill my glass house with food. Thanks to the sponsor of today's video, Every Plate. Every Plate is the best value meal service in America. And I get to just relax with all of the ghosts that I know while they plan, shop, and deliver all of the groceries I need at a consistently low price. There are other meal kit services that it's like, are you putting gold in your pasta? No. And Every Plate provides those same high quality fresh ingredients at a much better value. Everything comes pre-portioned and measured out. I don't have to waste food or throw away another wilted bag of greens. You can choose between 17 rotating recipes every month and you can swap out veggies, proteins, and side dishes as you wish. What I love about Every Plate is that it keeps my kitchen skills sharp to the point where they're just above below average. And it's just fun. I love doing it, okay? And you can do it too. Get started with Every Plate for just $1.79 per meal by going to everyplate.com and entering the code NickDeramia179. And once you got your plate all packed, let's get back to the scares and the thrills. When they got to the house, Matthew Lillard, who we know as Cyrus's assistant from the first movie, is pretending to be an electrician outside. And he's like, can you tell me where the basement is? I'm here. Cause you're about to mess up the power for the whole town. So they're like, whatever, just get out. As soon as you show me where you hit the basement, as soon as I can get my ass out of here. I'd be like, what is your job title again? Electrical engineer of standing too close to me? You need to back up. So the lawyer is sweet talking Arthur by being like, you guys won't be poor ever again. Well, what's his name? What is the stupid psychic's name? Dennis is downstairs and we see the ghost for the first time. He puts on his ghost goggles. <laughs> These sound effects are triggering a horrible memory I have of being in a car accident. And I'm pretty sure it's from a past life. I was driving to the homecoming dance where I was gonna finally work up the courage to sing backup for the doo-wop band, which is 1950s slang for sharing a terrified group kiss with two boys from the church choir in a darkened music room. Yes, I sang in a choir in my past life too. Sorry that being a homosexual tenor is at the essence of my soul. This Matthew Lillard screaming <laughs> is like the Scooby do of it all, it just cannot get out of my brain. When Dennis gets upstairs, he starts warning Arthur. He's like, this place is not safe. You gotta get out your family out of here. I know who your uncle is. I used to, I used to hunt ghosts with your uncle Cyrus. Goats? Ghosts! Are you just living for this comic relief? Because Tony Shalhoub is making me laugh just as hard as when my family used to watch episodes of Monk with my Nana, which wasn't that much because we were in a hospital room and just trying to keep her comfortable during the end. Again, I recognize these funny exchanges from people who I was introduced to in kids movies. And I think that's why, and a lot of other people, it seems from the early thousands, remember this one. There are kids in it, so it feels PG-13, even though it's not, it's pretty dark. There's lots of visible bone crushing, but upon re-watching it, I can see how it ruined its chances with adult audiences. Cause now I never know when I should take anything seriously or not. One minute it feels like I'm watching Spy Kids and the next it's like watching a horror character fantasy cosplay competition. What the sentence was that? What bizarre collection of consonants and syllables was that cacophony? The lawyer writes this guy off by being like, oh, this was, I know who this is. He's always bothering our office claiming that Cyrus owes him money, but he seems to know a lot about what's going on. <laughs>
I'm still not sure what sort of convulsion-based psychic ability Dennis is supposed to have. I guess if you touch him, he sees a Y2K goth rock video of your wife catching on fire. Also, why did we see a few frames of the youngest kid in the car on the way here, as well as a few frames of the wife from the end of the movie? I guess Matthew Lillard's character is also watching this movie that he's in. That would explain the seizures. I'm right there with you, Matthew Lillard. Okay, this, you know when you finally see a character get what they've been begging for the whole time? We have that moment for Kathy here. <gasps> Sweetheart, you just stomped into this room and started dabbing the previous owner's urine sample onto your throat. If that's what you call striking gold, then I guess I love the wordplay. Finally, Dennis the psychic starts to compose himself enough that he can give us some much needed exposition. How's your head? I haven't had any complaints yet. Why are you even being nice to this guy who broke into your home that you just won from a dead family member by using false pretenses? And who your lawyer who you trust just said he's trying to rob you. I'd be like, okay, home invader, have fun dying in the corner over there because all our phones are not working and my CPR certification expired. Tony Shalhoub and his family are so uninteresting. Like he's a mathematician. What's that about? The kid has this tape recorder where he records local obituaries. How come? When does that matter? Also, this girl loves bathrooms. You're not even trying. You're not even trying to the bathroom. Not by the hair of my coconut cluster would I be okay with liking a bathroom, man. Not me and my coconut cluster for Easter. <laughs> I forget if or why it matters how the lawyer goes into the basement. Oh, he goes to collect his money, but he reveals the 13 ghosts. What are you staring at? Hey, kiddo. Hey, nice tits. Oh. Yes, that's very scary looking makeup you have on, actors. Everyone be sure to show up the one thing you're holding. A bat, a tomahawk, a knife, a key? That's escalation, mama. Uh my key, my key. This movie predicted how all the haunted house scare actors had to stay behind plexiglass at Six Flags during the pandemic. This shows us the firstborn son, who is canceled by the way, unless he has actual native heritage, the torn prince and the angry princess. I hate how closely we can see all of them and in non-scary situations so we can really take in how fake everything looks. You know what? This video won't feel complete unless I take a quick minute to run down all 12 of the 13 ghosts in this movie. I know it doesn't make sense. It's a sh movie. There is a DVD extra where Cyrus tells the story of each of the characters in the Black Zodiac. So I'm just going to give you the title card, Wildest Black Zodiac Backstory. I'm just gonna read you the craziest line from each of these. The firstborn son. One day, a neighbor found a real steel arrow in his parents' closet. His cap gun was no match for the arrow, and he died when the neighbor shot him through the head. I feel like the real villain here was the neighbor who shot the kid, but whatever. The torso. He is the ghost of a gambler called Jimmy the Gambler Gambino. This already feels a little prejudiced towards Italians. The bound woman. When her boyfriend found her cheating, he strangled her and killed the other boy. He buried her body at the 50 yard line of the local football field. Then why is her ghost tied up? Couldn't she have been like hung from the goalpost to make it make sense? And if she's a cheerleader, why is she in a prom dress? Couldn't they have just made her a cheerleader or made the story so she wasn't a cheerleader? The Torn Prince. He is the ghost of Royce Clayton, born in 1940, who was a gifted baseball star in high school. In 1957, he challenged a greaser named Johnny to a drag race. Very cinematic uh, storytelling, but also confusing. Couldn't he have just died playing baseball? The Pilgrimist? She is the ghost of Eli Isabella Smith, an English woman who traveled across the Atlantic and settled in New England during colonial times. When she emerged from a burning barn completely unharmed, she was sentenced to the stocks. I mean, maybe none of us should have colonized this land in the first place. I think Mother Nature would agree with that. The Great Child and the Dire Mother, two of my favorites, Ghosts 8 and 9. One day, some of the carnival employees decided to play a little practical joke on Harold and kidnapped his mother. <laughs> carnival workers do not 
around on April Fool's Day. Do they think it's the purge? 11, the jackal. Ryan gnawed through the jacket until doctors finally locked his head in a metal cage and sealed him away. When a fire broke out in the asylum, he chose to stay behind and face the fire. His cage may have heated up enough to where he ripped it open before the fire consumed him. I don't get it. Does having mental illness give him a higher boiling point than other human beings? And also than metal? The juggernaut. That's who I called the jackhammer at the beginning. Messed it up. Standing seven feet tall, he was such a grotesque height and appearance that everyone ostracized him as a child. Was he seven feet tall as a child? So the lawyer does his part by grabbing his money and then triggering the house to spring shut. But he doesn't seem to realize that that also starts to release some of the ghosts in the basement, which leads us to this death. <laughs> I guess for dessert, we'll be having the banana split. <laughs> oh, the joke would work better if he was a banana. And if they were eating dinner, all right, I guess it's a bad joke. Unless you're eating dinner while watching this, in which case you owe me your laughter. This was the most gruesome shot in the movie by far. And the filmmakers were actually surprised that the censors didn't make them cut away. It looks great. I love the cauliflower look of a bisected brain. It's very much like the cell starring Jennifer Lopez when they split apart that horse. So. That's the torn princess who had the hardest makeup job with full body appliances and full body paint. And she's about to attack our girl, Kathy, except, oh wait, no, she's fine. <laughs> This girl is in some dark house that's weird as hell and yet is fully determined to live her clear as hell face splash fantasy anyway. Oh, she's not the torn princess, the angry princess. I didn't read her thing. She's Dana Newman, who did not believe in her own natural beauty. Abusive boyfriends fueled her low self-esteem, which led to much unneeded plastic surgery. And Dana Newman is just sitting in this tub watching some girl drink her bath water. Like, is this girl for real right now? Why not give us a splash of Kathy like getting blood all over her face that nobody else can see like in the It miniseries? It's such a cop out. They did two takes of the action where the water was clear and where the water was bloody. So they could have just saved it to the end of the day and let Kathy get bloody. There must be a reason why they didn't. Anyway, nothing comes of that scary visual. So I don't understand why I'm supposed to think any of these ghosts are scary if they're just like, we're watching you. All all these ghosts know is pain, so they're not inflicting pain though. So Arthur grabs Kathy just in time with Maggie and they realize that they can't find the little kid. Oh, I gotta learn his name now. Bobby. Bobby is down in the basement while Dennis explains that there are prayers on all the walls because it keeps the ghosts contained and they're glass because it's spectral glass. I don't know what the glass is. But while Bobby's in the basement exploring, he sees what looks like the ghost of Cyrus and then he's snatched off the ground. Maggie and Dennis go off on their own and Dennis finally explains to Maggie, oh my God, look at these glasses, you can see ghosts. And she's like, oh, it's so scary. Meanwhile, Kathy does the same. And it's sort of like, are these ghosts not initially scary till you put on the glasses? Cause that's what they make it seem like. <laughs> Told you, there's the whole reason they wanted to keep this character's age a little vague. So they could include gratuitous close-ups of her breasts being exposed while they're violently scratched by the ghosts of a sex offender. I mean, that's Hollywood, mama. I love the perfect ribbons of shredded clothing they have in her clothes. They should have frayed edges in this costume. The jackal, that ghost who just attacked, has like long overgrown fingernails from being a straitjacket. He's not a cheetah in the wild. It seems like the jackal is pulling on cat Kathy and Arthur is just about to lose her when Malika, Kalina, really not Malika, I'm pretty sure, Kalina, Miss Honey, jumps into the scene and shoots the ghost with a flare. And I guess that's a ghost flare? You got me. That gives him enough time to like pull Kathy to safety. <laughs> Oh, 
Okay, that was almost a scary chase sequence up until the most terrifying ghost in this whole movie just donked its noggin on a sliding glass door. And the editing, like why do we get a full on shot of the ceiling light? I don't need that. Again, all of these ghosts start to feel cheesy as soon as they're harmlessly trapped behind glass like zoo animals. All they can do is facially menace you while smacking the window as hard as possible without the edges of their prosthetic appliances coming unglued. With a name like the Jackal, you do not want us to see you in a close up with your lace lifting. And for the Jackal in particular, the longer we get to look at him, the more it starts to feel like Halloween Town 2 Calabar's Revenge. Anyway, now Kalina's in the mix. She's in the mix now. Another one of Cyrus's victims. Cyrus had a nasty habit of enslaving souls. That's why I'm here. I intend to set them all free. She said, this is my character motive and these are my character motivations. And don't even ask how I got inside this impenetrable house just in time to save you. That's really personal, like asking me my bra size or how many ghosts I've had sex with at one time. And the answer is obviously 13 because that's where the title of the movie comes from. There is a porn parody of this movie as well, just so we know. Okay, get ready, buckle down. We're at the 50 minute mark, so we better tell you the story of life. The making of a certain machine. One that can see into the future. I can't believe Cyrus built it. What are you talking about? We're in the middle of a machine designed by the devil and powered by the dead. And yet the worst part about it is we have to wear safety goggles that shine LED lights directly into our eyes. I'm so annoyed that they try to make all of that explanation seem interesting by cutting it with footage from the Zillow virtual home tour. We get it, this house is mostly hallways and almost no rooms. So we're gonna keep looking. They probably shot that as plates for the DVD menu or something, but this director would use footage from the movie's rap party if he could add enough flashbulb transitions to it. Watch this. Come on, we gotta get out of here. Now that is clearly a kid who's going for scariest costume at the Halloween block party this year. Very dark-sided McHale, great job. It's almost impossible to feel afraid of these ghosts when so many of them don't kill anyone and just show up on screen to do nothing but to like tell you don't go down this hallway. Like I'm pretty sure there are a few flash frames where we just see this kid hanging from the ceiling in between takes like talking to the director. Meanwhile, Maggie and Dennis are having their own adventure cause they have to share a pair of glasses. So I mean, and there's a little bit of a plot device here where it's like Maggie has to use the glasses and help Dennis avoid being hit by the torn prince with his bat. Very lemonade. Hold up, they don't love you like I love you. Also, Maggie is using the pane of glass as her shield, so that's something that comes into play. Anyway, this is my key. A key? <laughs> Ew, I really don't like them. They said, mm -mm, you're not coming down this corridor, not on opposite day. The great child and the smothered, what is it? The choked mother, something crazy down. <laughs> the great child and the dire mother. How dark, where did all this come from? I also downloaded the 1960s movie, so maybe I'll watch that too. I wanna see if they use similar ghost concepts or what? All right, so the house keeps shifting and moving at like the worst times to unleash new ghosts on them and and like when the four of them meet up to all look for Bobby together, the juggernaut, he attacks Arthur, but they throw one of those flares at him, which is like, I guess just the perfect like 10 seconds of running thing. Oh, and then we see this ghosty. <laughs> You can't tell me it doesn't look slapstick and cheesy when these ghosts smack their face up against the window. We can literally see the nostril print of face paint that the pilgrimess leaves behind on the glass when she disappears. I hate how obvious it is that they just shot for each of the ghosts like several minutes of being scary behind glass footage and then just cut it in with reaction shots that were shot on separate days. And now all the characters are like, whoa, oh, whoa, I hate when they do that. It's like, I do too, cause it's boring. And like with the torn prints or the juggernaut Every time they hit the glass, it's just like a spark explosion. It's like, all right, that's really not scary. Like if it could be something like the glass like bows outward or something, then you would be like, oh, it's like a scary heavy punch or whatever. What makes them dangerous? I don't have electricity in me. If they could show me what those punches look like even once, like if a ghost punched you, does that just like make you suck all the life out of you and you turn gray? That would be scary. Then you would know like, ooh, those are some 
and dangerous ghosts. But I'm like waiting for them to come out from behind the glass so that they can literally like punch me. I mean, okay. So once they get separated from all the ghosts, and they're upstairs. Dennis starts to tell Arthur what he knows, which is not only was he chosen by Uncle Cyrus to be the 13th ghost in this whole machine, which is required to make it work, but also the fourth ghost is his wife who recently died in the fire. And he's like, why, why, why? Meanwhile, it seems like Maggie is getting just as impatient with I am over the endless exposition. This house is not a house. It is a machine. So what, lady? Machines are usually a good thing. It's what soft serve comes out of. Maggie, keep speeding them through these boring explanations. I fully endorse it. Love is the most powerful energy, Arthur. Meaning? So she speeds through the characters of the Black Zodiac that I already told you in a better way and uh, tells us why Cyrus would even want this house machine of the damned to work. Knowledge is power. And the man who controls the ocularis would be the most powerful man on earth. Oh, so that's the thing I don't care about. I hate when the villain in a movie is just going after a general, supreme world power. How are you going to control the world specifically after you can predict the future? Become rich using the stock markets? Overthrow the United Nations? Grow out your hair and start a religious cult? Like, what am I worried about? So anyway, it's determined that in order to save the kids, which she's putting it as like, oh, Cyrus is using your kids because we need an innocent sacrifice to make the machine work. And then they're like, if you jump into the machine though, your selfless love will cause the machine to be broken. I'm like, who could possibly know any of this? This is all like, where's the owner's manual? What are you talking about? So anyway, they go, they split up. Kalina and Maggie split up from Dennis and Arthur. There's a lot of crazy CGI green screen effects with Maggie and Kalina going into the basement. Oh, but then once they get to the heart of the machine, Kalina knocks out Maggie and we find out she's double crossing us. She's actually working with Cyrus who is not dead, but alive. And all of this has been planned from the beginning. She's like, I've been doing everything you asked. I killed Damon. And it's like, no, you didn't. We saw Damon dying of an accidental injury from the ghost at the beginning. Did you smother him and we didn't see it? Like, how did you kill him without him knowing? that you stabbed him or whatever. Meanwhile, Dennis and Arthur are having a time when someone attacks them. I think the juggernaut attacks them and Dennis sacrifices himself by trapping Arthur behind this glass while he gets juggernaut killed. It's really boring watching him die, but it's supposed to be emotional. And then they try to make it more emotional by showing Tony Shalhoub, his ghost wife through the glass. Meanwhile, Cyrus has no loyalty to even Kalina, who seems like was his lover. I thought I told you, greatness requires sacrifice. That's how the toaster strudel in my back pocket must feel whenever I get a seat on the bus. Apparently there was an alternate version of this shot where Kalina's eyeball also pops out. So why don't those suits over at Warner Brothers stop trying to copyright claim this video and get to work releasing 13 ghosts the eyeball edit instead. Make your salaries worth something. All right, this is where things get real annoying. <laughs> Cyrus uses uh, his spells that he's procured to start calling the ghosts towards the machine. I guess that was important too. And they all are visibly like spinning around the two kids who are at the middle of the machine. I guess they're like sacrificing the kids now. This guy starts like beating up on Arthur and I'm like, okay, it's a 40 year old man against a 75 year old man, whatever. Also this sucks too. Maggie is down in the basement control room at the machine, just like pounding on it, messing with wires to break it. And it somehow works. Like wasn't Tony Shalhoub's life sacrifice supposed to be what disrupts the machine? Not just pressing every button, but she does so much of it that like the ghosts no longer are under his control because Tony Shalhoub like kicks them off. The doors are going crazy. Oh, and then the ghosts just like go and are like, we'll pick up that guy now. And they just go after Cyrus instead. And I'm like, I didn't even register how nonsensical this is. Like just that nothing's explained. <laughs> Oh, 
Excuse me, these kids should be absolutely showered in blood and great uncle entrails right now. This is the big finish. Why are they so clean? This could echo the beginning scene where they sprayed blood all over the junkyard, but then never came up again. Never came up again that the ghosts are like attracted to blood somehow. Cause none of the murders seemed particularly bloody. Like even Dennis got beat to death with a bat full of sparks and never showed much blood. So what is the blood? So now that Cyrus has been torn to pieces, you saw some of that cheesy, like would be 3D effect. The machine is starting to break and then Arthur sees the ghost of Dennis show up and be like, you can do this. And that inspires Dennis to make this impossible jump through these razor blades spinning around his kids and protect their heads during this explosion that apparently kills Maggie down in the basement, which is like, what the f Oh, and then I think test audiences must have rioted that apparently the main characters were like, ah, our good, good family friend is dead. They're just like, we're happy now. It's Cause then they give us this little tag where Maggie's like somehow survived this insane basement explosion. It's like, this was not in the job description. It's like very lame. And then at the end, the machine is broken and it seems like all is well. The ghosts have transcended to heaven, including ghost number four, wifey McBurned face. Mom? That's right, and your selfless killing of that old man has painfully removed all of her burn tissue and replaced it with Lancome Double Wear Foundation. And that's why she can finally ride this lazy Susan right into heaven. I'm so surprised by how hardcore scary I thought that this movie was, probably just cause it was a hard R rating, but like the actual screenplay was really, they really found a way to water down that R rating. Let me know, did you grow up feeling traumatized by this movie? Did this help you resolve any of those issues? Am I finally earning credit for my psychology certification by counseling you? Let me know in the comments below. Also give this video a big thumbs up if you wanna see even more clip breakdowns on horror movies. You know I love to do it. But most importantly, if you're new to my channel, I would love to have you click that subscribe button right over here. That way you never miss new videos from me. I upload two new ones every week. So turn on notifications if you wanna be the first to know when I'm summoning ghosts with a spell and I'm summoning ghosts so well. Also, I've got merch available, oh, ready for summer and a Patreon where you can access exclusive bonus merch, virtual watch parties, and extra episodes of Clip Breakdown. Oh my God, these were two keys the whole time. You guys are all the greatest. Thank you for counting to 13 ghosts with me today. I will see you next time.